Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to the Why Travel Podcast. I'm chatting today with author, long-term traveller, travel publisher, and our friend, Tim Leffel. Like us, Tim and his wife, Donna, are long-term travellers who have embraced the living abroad lifestyle with their daughter as well, and now live in the Mexican Highlands. Tim is the author of The World's Cheapest Destinations, Travel Writing 2.0, and the Living Abroad book, A Better Life for Half the Price. In this podcast, we're going to dive deep into topics focused on living abroad, and Tim will share many of his insights into how to make it work, where to live abroad, and how to know if you're cut out for it. It's just me, Kaz, flying solo for this interview. Remember, if you love what you hear, share it with another travel lover you know. They'll thank you for it. All right. Well, welcome, Tim. We're excited to have you on the podcast Thanks and for... all the way from Mexico. Yeah, thanks for having me. And wonders of technology. We can uh, even see each other. I know. It's like, I guess we're all kind of used to this over the past year is hanging out on Zoom kind of calls. Yeah. Keeping in the trend. So we're going to chat a bit today about uh, living abroad because that is your specialty and you have uh, a new book out, A Better Life for Half the Price. So I wanted you to be able to share your wisdom about that because Craig and I have done a lot of living abroad and it's the number one strategy that we recommend to people who say, well, I want to travel more, but I can't afford it. Um, So it's a, it's a great strategy. And I know that you agree with me and and you have a ton of information, but I think that I've caught you just after breakfast in Mexico. So do you want to sort of paint that picture for us? (laughs) Well, you know, that typical living abroad life. Yeah. (laughs) It didn't quite work out the way I wanted because this restaurant I (laughs) I usually go to that's um, got lots of outdoor tables, it was actually full. So apparently lots of people had the same idea I did today. But normally when I go there, you get like a fruit plate and a juice and coffee and chilaquiles and uh, huevos rancheros and something like that, some bread. And, you know, it's a big feast and it's about four dollars, four fifty, something like that. But um, I, I was thwarted on that today, so I bought two tamales on the street for a um, dollar fifty instead, and brought those home. <laughs> and they're, oh my they're gosh! Really, they're really good tamales too. Sometimes you can find them cheaper than that, but these are really good. And I've done lots of market research in the area. Um, but uh, you can also go get a uh, fresh squeezed juice for about a buck, which is always nice. And I usually get the green one, which is. Um, orange juice, pineapple juice, but then a whole bunch of green stuff, you know, celery and cilantro and nopales, which are cactus. They'll put a little ginger in there and it's a buck. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. That's and, unbelievable. And uh, we can get really good coffee here too, because a lot of it grows in Mexico um, and Chiapas oh, yeah. and uh, Oaxaca and other places. So, yeah, um, I try to take advantage of that. I mean, you know what it's like when you're working at home, you get a little stir crazy. And during the pandemic, mm-hmm. it was... Uh, you know, we were all holed up for quite a while. But the good thing about uh, the highlands of Mexico is you can eat outside all year long and it's really pleasant. I mean, it doesn't get all that hot or all that cold. And so we're at 6,500 feet. So that kind of helped us during wow. this whole thing to be able to enjoy the outdoors. Yeah. And so you're in the highlands of Mexico. So what made you decide to live there? And kind of can you, if you've lived in other places, how does it compare? Yeah, back to your point first about living abroad to, uh, you know, save money on your travels. I mean, we we taught English uh, when we were younger, before we had a kid in um, Korea, South Korea and Turkey. And I would strongly advise that experience for anyone who wants to make some money at a physical job, you know, that doesn't have some kind of online thing they can do or an online business or whatever. It's a great way to sort of immerse yourself in the culture and and depending on where you go, you can make pretty good money at it too. Um, when we lived, when we lived in Turkey, we basically just made enough to live on, which was fine. We were happy with that. It it enabled us to spend, you know, half a year in Turkey, but we went to Korea and signed a contract for a whole year and you can make real money there. And there's some other places too in Asia and the middle East, but we, um, had our rent paid for because that's how it usually works and they'll fly you there. 
And so we socked away $30,000 in a year between the two of us. And um, I mean, we were working a lot, doing private lessons and stuff too. And this was 1998. So this is like, you know, going a ways back. So that was worth a lot of money. So we traveled for a whole other year after that and still had a load of cash in the bank when we came home. So that worked out well. But anyway, um, when I had a child, you know, we were kind of stuck in place for a while. But once she got old enough to that we thought we could take her and take her with us. We just started looking around for a place to live. And we looked at a lot of places in Latin America, but settled on Mexico just because it's easy and it's close. And we wanted to be able to get back to the, to see the family. But also this is a great place to live culturally. You know, there's a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of, you know, live music and events and things like that normally and really good food and um, just a lot of diversity. It's a big country. so. Uh, we had, it had a lot going for us and it ticked off a lot of boxes and you could stay here for six months on a tourist visa too, which is another huge advantage. So there's a lot of digital nomads that have come here over the last year because they couldn't go anywhere else. And so, uh, yeah. you just have to leave the country and come back. Um, you know, now we're getting residency. We can talk about that later. We had it once before, but it's so easy to get by on tourist visas here that a lot of people don't bother. Yeah, and I guess um, that's one thing when people are, are looking to move abroad, um, they have to really consider visas because you really want to have permission to live in a country. And we've already, always told people, like, don't break the laws because you could it could come back and bite you later on. You could get deported and then blacklisted from other countries, so it's not great to have on your record. So how how have you gone about figuring out um, you know, where you can actually live and work and what are some things people should consider in that regard before moving abroad? Yeah, so when I was writing this second edition of the book, this was kind of my pandemic project. Um, I had lots of time on my hands last year and the good thing was it was really easy to reach people. And so I interviewed about 80 yeah. people that were living in various countries around the world. So I got a real sense of, you know, what they had gone through to get residency if they did. Um, mm. I do want to point out that there's a few countries like Mexico where you can pretty much stay indefinitely on tourist visas. Um, Georgia is mm. one of them, the country of Georgia. You can stay for a year there just for the asking. It's also um, Americans can stay for a year in Albania. And then if you get a visa for India, it's good for 10 years and you just have to leave once every six months. Oh. So that's another easy one, too. But most countries make it more difficult. I mean, you're starting to see these digital nomad visas coming out now or remote worker oh. visas. But unfortunately, they've mostly been in pretty um, expensive countries like uh, islands in the Caribbean and, you know, um, Croatia, which is not a bad deal, but it's not a great deal either. And so um, I'm just kind of waiting for it to spread beyond that. Um, there's been a few like Portugal and Spain that have made it easier for uh, people to move there. And But it's really tough in Asia, and that's kind of discouraging for people from your country. It's really hard to move to Bali or to Thailand or a lot of these countries and stay legally um, without being retired. You know, a lot of them will have a retirement visa, but if you're not 65, mm -hmm. then you're out of luck. And so I'm hoping that will change in the coming years because we're a desirable demographic to attract. I mean, we're not using a lot of local resources and we're spending freely and uh, hiring locals yeah. sometimes. So, you know, it's pretty, a pretty good position for them. Yeah. And I know I've just, I've heard Bali's been in the news a bit lately because they're tightening up their visas, I think, because people are sort of coming in and um, maybe taking advantage in some ways. So, yeah, it is. Uh, some countries are easier than others. And then you have a country like Australia, my country, which I know makes it difficult for anybody coming in. Unless but, you're you know, they do group, have, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right, because Craig and I, we used to go or live in other countries on the working holiday visa because we were part of the Commonwealth, so that made it really easy. But it restricts you until I believe it's 30, maybe up to 35. So after that, you kind of lose access to that visa because they're worried about how you'll drain their health system. Yeah, it's the opposite of the retirement visa. <laughs> you have to be young. <laughs> uh, but yeah, <laughs> but just as far as, you know, what it what it takes for these countries to get legal, it, it just differs a lot from country to country. So you kind of have to, you know, dive into it for any place you're thinking of going. I mean, it can be done almost everywhere eventually if you're willing to go through the bureaucracy and the, the time and the money. I mean, 
unfortunately, as you found out, the U.S. is one of the hardest. So for people coming the other way, mm -hmm. it's really difficult. But usually yeah. um, poorer countries, I mean, there's no really other way to put it. People, countries with a low GDP <laughs> per capita are usually more welcoming because they, they want your money. But that's not always true. I mean, it's it's true in Vietnam and Cambodia, but it's not true in Thailand. So it's really hard to kind of paint a whole region with a certain brush. And even through Latin America, there's some places like Panama and Ecuador that make it super easy. So they're very popular for, you know, people moving abroad. And then there's others like Bolivia that should be easy, but they make it so difficult that nobody ever moves there. <laughs> and so why, what makes a destination more popular than others or what kind of better life are people looking for and what drives them to actually go because it's not easy and you and I both know that uh, to live abroad so so what is it about this better life that people are seeking so I think people normally move for one of three reasons um, the one my book addresses is the financial one you can just get a lot better life for your money in a, in a country mm. where expenses are lower I mean if you're keeping half of what you earn instead of having to spend all of it on bills, you know, then you're going to have a lot more fun and enjoy life a lot more. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, you, you can get more house for your money. You can, I've got a housekeeper working here right now. You know, she comes twice a week normally. So why not? You know, because <laughs> it's a, the yeah. price is right. Um, if we got somebody in the U.S., it was like once every six months because it was so expensive in comparison. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one reason. Um, another one is weather. That's a big reason for people living in Canada or the northern U.S. Um, they've had enough of shoveling snow and dealing with ice and all of that and heating mm -hmm. bills, and they're just ready to move somewhere where it's sunny and warm all the time. And then the last one is, um, you know, political or life circumstances. Um, you know, we've all met a few uh, strange expats in the world that were running away from something but uh, a lot of times people move for political reasons they're sick of what's going on in their country and you know they just want to escape or the healthcare system you know that's also an escape a lot of times um, it kind of ties mm -hmm. in with the financial part but you know the u.s u.s healthcare system is a mess and it's very it's very expensive mess so you can move to almost anywhere else in the world and lower your health care expenses so that's a big one for a lot of people yeah, definitely understand the U.S. <laughs> the mess of the U.S. health and the expenses doesn't make it attractive to stay here. That's for sure. And I know Craig and I, we used to, we kind of did the opposite, I guess, in that we used the living abroad strategy as a short as a short term way to um, experience and travel through more expensive countries. So we would like live in London or Dublin and, and work there so that we were earning the local currency and then travel out from there. Because if you're earning the pound in London, that goes so much further in um, like Europe, if you were to travel Europe. Well, back then when I was doing it anyway. And then we would like you, you saved up your 30,000, we would save up money and then we'd travel for extended period periods of time, like through Africa and Southeast Asia and backpack that way. So that's another sort of way people can look at it if they just wanted something temporary rather than moving abroad like full time. Yeah. And if you have any kind of skills that are easily transferable, that can be a, a good strategy. You know, if you're a, a teacher or you work in finance or you're a scientist uh, or you're, you know, computer engineer, then you can have a lot more mobility. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a good strategy. Otherwise, if you try to move to Switzerland, and you're earning 20 grand a year from your online job, that's really not going to cut it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, that's true. So you really have to consider that. But if you want to move to Ecuador and $20,000 a year, you'll be in great shape. You'll have a, a really nice life. So you kind of have to um, adjust your, your place to what kind of money you've got coming in. And, um, and then, you know, I'm not saying you move to those places just because of the finances, because if you do that, you're probably not going to be happy. I mean, you should like the country. Mm. You should like the people and the culture. Um, there are plenty of rich people living in Panama that live there just because they like it, you know. And um, so, you know, find a place that kind of ticks all the right boxes for you and and uh, makes you happy from a heart standpoint as well. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. I mean, um, a lot of people... I remember when tr sort of travel blogging came out, everyone was kind of 
working to earn enough money to live in Chiang Mai, which is great. I mean, Chiang Mai is wonderful, but Craig and I were like, okay, we, we want to earn enough money to be able to live wherever we want. And I think it's really important what you say is to to look at how much money do you have, where can you afford to live, but also where do you want to live? Yeah. So you have that sort of balance there. And, you know, there's plenty of desirable places that are, less expensive than where you are now there's plenty that are the same you know it just kind of depends on um you know what your earnings are and what you can afford and i mean i'm at a point now where i could live anywhere in the world too but i really like i really get a mm. kick out of my money going a long way i love to eat a four dollar oh, breakfast yeah. you know it just makes me happy <laughs> yes so, <laughs> go out for dollar beers you know i'm a happy camper but i could get dollar beers so uh, yeah. You know, that just elevates my mood. Whereas when I go somewhere like uh, Sweden, it's like, oh, man, I don't know if I'm going to order yeah. that. I don't know if I'm going to order that appetizer or not. <laughs> yeah, it, it hurts, doesn't it, when you have to sort of go, oh, OK, I don't think I can have that beer or that glass of wine. But knowing that if you're in Mexico, you could have the whole shebang. <laughs> yeah, I, I brought up Sweden because when I was there, I went out drinking one night with a bunch of people and. I think my bill was like 70 or $80, you know, and I didn't have that many drinks, you know, and I was thinking, man, if I were back home in Mexico, this would be like me and all my friends, you know, the whole tab. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's crazy. I was in uh, New York the last time we were there for IMM and I ordered, uh, it's kind of in reverse, but I ordered a mezcal because it's like my favorite yeah. liquor. And I didn't think to ask the barman, like, which mezcal he was serving me or how much it was. I just kind of asked for it thinking and I would, you know, just get something sort of normal range. And then I went to pay for my bill and it was like nearly $30 for <laughs> one mezcal. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I was like, oh my, I need to be living in Mexico and... I need to ask the server from now on how much the best Kelly is. Yeah, I was in a hotel in New York last time I was there and I took a picture of the menu because the beers were double digits. And I was like, come on, you know, it's just a beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not that, it's not worth that much no. for sure. <laughs> anyway. So take us through, um, I mean, we live in the US now, obviously. When we're not from here, Australian, but we love um, we love living as foreigners, and we always say that it it makes like the everyday exciting. Even just going to the grocery store can be exciting because it's all just so new. I remember the first time we walked into the grocery store in the US. I mean, we were completely overwhelmed, <laughs> but it was it was an exciting overwhelming because it was so new. So what what's the everyday like for you and even though you've lived in Mexico for some time now do you still kind of have that um connection to the awe of it or the excitement of it yeah I've been telling people I was really I was really glad to be stuck here during this pandemic rather than be stuck in Florida where I used to live because yeah every every day is kind of interesting and different when you walk out the door you know it's a different culture people are speaking a different language and yeah, even just the shopping experience is so different. I mean, we do have one giant supermarket here, but it's kind of on the edge of town. And so we don't go there that often, like maybe once every two weeks to kind of stock up on stuff that we can't get other other places. But the rest of the time, we're just like going from store to store like you would in, in Europe still. You know, you go to the fruit fruiteria, it's called, where you get your fruit and vegetables. Um, you go to the butcher shop to buy meat. You go to another place to buy bread. And, you know, those places specialize in those things. And some of the fruit and vegetables you just buy off old ladies on the street. You know, they just spread their stuff out and, and you buy from him from them. They're selling honey from their farm, you know, stuff like that. So that's really fun and interesting for me still. Um, you know, there's a big market culture here. You just wander through the market and grab what you want, throw it in your bag. And, um, and it's funny, I don't even ask how much stuff is, you know, because the fruit and vegetables are so cheap. It's like a dollar a kilo for a lot of stuff. So I just throw everything yeah, wow. up on the scale and they weigh it and tell me how much it is. And, you know, if I spend ten dollars, it's more than I can carry sometimes, you know, two of us have to go. Wow. So <laughs> you got to take your bags with you. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, I mean, my my life is a, a little less complicated now. When I had a, a child in school, she's older now, but um we used to take a taxi to her school and then I would take the bus back. And um, after a while she started doing it on her own, but 
we would take a taxi across town. It was three dollars, and that's still the price, by the way. <laughs> um, and then we, wow. I would I would take a bus back, which is like thirty cents, thirty five cents, something like that. And that was how I would start my morning and listen to podcasts and whatever. But um, I do a lot of walking here. You can do some hiking too. There's some mountains around the city um, that are really nice for hiking. To, but um, you know, life is not as um, varied as it was um, before the pandemic, yeah. just because a lot of stuff is shut down or you just don't feel safe going inside. Like mm -hmm. there's a symphony here and they haven't had a concert for a year and a half, you know, or something like that. I don't know. Since last January, mm -hmm. um, there's usually a lot of live music and there's this thing called the Serventino Festival every year. That's um, a three week long um, music and arts festival. It's a lot of fun. It gets really crowded, but it's a lot of fun. But that was canceled last year and will probably be canceled this mm -hmm. year. I don't know. But uh, anyway, yeah, I like uh, just wandering around and and just uh, checking out the city. It's always just kind of fun. It, like you said, everything's just a little bit different. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, every day's an adventure for sure. And you mentioned your daughter um, in going to school. And so I know just from the community that we have that a lot of people are worried about traveling with their kids full time just within their own country. Or, and then moving abroad with their children throws up another kind of barrier to them. So what has that experience been like for you living abroad with your daughter and, and kind of what sort of challenges were there and, and sort of what do people have to look out for? Yeah, um, I want to backtrack to bring something up. We got my daughter's passport when she was three years old and, and the first place we went was Mexico um, to the Yucatan Peninsula near Merida. And... Um, what what I found really interesting is I had backpacked around the world and sometimes I was alone, sometimes with my wife. But when I was alone, it was really hard for me to talk to women in a lot of countries like they just don't want to talk to a single man. And, you, you know, you can't blame them. They don't know you. Um, and, you know, there's a little distrust there. But then I found it was so drastically different when I was with my daughter, then it was no problem, you know, <laughs> then I could have all these conversations yeah. with the moms and it was totally cool because my daughter was with me. And so then I wasn't a threat anymore. And I found that really interesting. Like it changed the whole dynamic. Um, but I love traveling with a kid because, um, you know, a child will see things in totally different ways and, and be enamored by things that you didn't notice, you know, that you should have noticed maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just the everyday experience is so exciting to them that uh, mm -hmm. everything's an adventure. Um, I mean, there's a trade-off. you got to slow down. You can't see as many things in a day. You know, those whirlwind sightseeing trips yeah. don't work too well. Um, you got to build in your <laughs> playground time. Uh, <laughs> um, but, yeah, living here with her was kind of um, different also because since she was in a school with all Mexicans, um, I mean, it was a private school, but, you know, still there were maybe one or two foreigners in the whole school besides her. So we talked a lot more to local people when, when she was in school. That was mm. sort of a gateway, you know, to having regular conversations in Spanish. And I feel like my Spanish has gotten a little worse um, <laughs> because I've been holed up in yeah, my home not office, practicing. not talking to anybody. But um, so, yeah, that was kind of nice. And my wife used to go out to lunch with um, some of the other moms once a month. And that was her time to like ask about things that were perplexing her, you know, about the culture, you know, or why, why do you guys do things this way? And she could get an answer, you know? So that's yeah. all kind of nice. So um, I found that in Korea too. It was really good to have some Korean friends who spoke English because um, just some things you just could not figure out. They were a total mystery, you know, it's good to have somebody yeah. that can solve the mysteries for you. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we always say um, like, we love, we had a lot of Thai friends that we, we hang out, we hung out with when we lived in Bangkok and, and we loved that experience of immersing ourselves in the culture there and, and just kind of hanging out with them, even though there were a lot of Australians around. And so I know there's a tendency when people go to uh, live abroad to find the expat community, which I think can have some value for those moments when you're really missing home it's nice to have that kind of cultural connection there with your with your own but we always say like do your best to branch out and and make friends with the local people i think that makes the experience so much more uh, richer for you yeah and it's 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 hard unfortunately uh i mean 
it's easy to get caught up in that expat bubble and, and, you know, mm. it's hard to break out of it just because, um, I mean, it's a real, there's a real value in that when you first move somewhere, especially, um, cause mm. they've got the lay of the land. They know they could tell you what to do mm -hmm. for getting your visa and where to buy this, where to buy that, you know, how to find a handyman. Um, but yeah, I mean, you tend to gravitate towards them cause they're speaking your language and you, you mm -hmm. see them on the street and, you know, you can pick each other out cause you don't look like everybody else. But um, yeah, it's it's there's a real value to having friends that are not part of that, and um, it can be difficult though because unless you're really fluent in the local language, you end up only mm. only making friends with the people who can speak English, and that that's kind of limiting in itself. Um, fortunately, here there's a symphony that's like half foreigners and half Mexicans, so that's kind of a, a <laughs> gateway into their world, um, you know. And there's some restaurant owners and bar owners and people like that that have had to learn English, you know, to for their business. So um, there are some around, but this city I'm in, there are not a lot of English speakers because there's a lot of tourists here, but they're mostly Mexican tourists, and so. Um, yeah, right. We're an hour and a half from San Miguel de Allende, which is a different story. There's like 10,000 foreigners there. So it's a whole whole different um, outlook. But here there's not many. So we um, had to learn the language, which is an advantage, I think. I mean, I wanted to live someplace where I would need to learn instead of mm. it being something that was a chore. You know, I wanted it to be just a part of the natural process. I want yeah, to point it's out another thing that makes the whole experience exciting. Yeah, I want to point out that Spanish is a lot easier than if you try to move to the Czech Republic or somewhere like that, um, mm -hmm. or Hungary, it's going to be a lot tougher. <laughs> yeah, or Thai. Thai was very... Yeah. <laughs> Thai was easy to learn It was because it had so many intonations in their words. Um, so it was hard. I remember one time we walked past an art seller on the street. Thankfully, we were with our Thai friends who could... <laughs> explain Craig's mistake but he the the word um I can't remember it now but um the word for beautiful actually has the same it's the same word used for shit it just <laughs> depends on your intonation oh, and no. so Craig walked past and called his artwork he thought beautiful but said it the wrong way <laughs> to say shit and it was only when he started having a go at Craig and we were like oh my gosh what's happened and our Thai <laughs> friend went and explained to the man <laughs> that's a really unfortunate uh, combination there to have the same word <laughs> I know so we never used that word again it was like we can't we can't make that mistake again because that's a bad mistake to make <laughs> and when we were in Thailand we spent a lot of time there and my and Donna was a pescatarian at the time and every single time she would order food, like on a train or in a market or something, she'd get the wrong thing, you know, like if she tried to order in Thai. And so I ended up eating it, you know, because it would be like, you know, some pork dish instead of the vegetable when she wanted. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> we had, we used to have the same problem in China and we had to um, get someone who we ran into an American who could speak Chinese and we were vegetarian at the time. So she had to write some um cards out for us with the characters on there to say that we were vegetarian and that really helped us yeah. get through <laughs> we did have one of those cards i think they still sell them where it's a like laminated card that has a bunch of pictures on it you just point to what you want <laughs> yeah yeah very handy but yeah. now we have apps apps yeah. that do all of that this way yeah and back I in mean, the days of fun travel google translate's getting pretty good too like when i was in the czech republic yeah. you could just point it at a menu and it won't be exactly right but it'll give you the general idea and I was amazed by that. <laughs> and then you could say, I want this. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I haven't, it's been a while since we've traveled internationally that way. So I'm excited to be able to uh, do it again, but use apps like that to help. Although I, I had this conversation with someone recently about, you know, things like Google Maps or Google App Tra Translator and, and how much um, it removes kind of our connection with the local people. Like it's nothing like getting lost and having to, try and pull someone flag someone down on the street and start up a conversation and oftentimes they you know will take you there themselves so it's kind of I think a lot of that's getting lost because of technology yeah I agree and I think you often ended up in a lot better budget motel too when you had to just show up and yeah. start looking around because you saw the room before you said yes <laughs> you know yes. Pic pictures online can be very deceiving <laughs> <laughs> so true yeah how, it was like the hostel walk how many 
places would you visit before you actually chose to yeah. decide which one you'd stay at? Yeah. That's one big advantage. It was a big advantage of traveling as a couple as opposed to a solo traveler because one person could stay with the bags and the other one could go scout yeah. out a hotel. So it saved you a lot of hassle. Um, every once in a while, I'll still travel like that just to make sure you can still do it. You know, like I'll just roll up to a place yeah. without a reservation and just kind of go poking around. And um, I got this last time I did that, I was in Nicaragua. And I got this uh, hotel with a bathroom and air conditioning for $6. And I was like, yes, this still works. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Those were the days for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, it sort of um, made you more free in a way because you could, um, mm. you didn't have advanced reservations anywhere. So if you didn't like a place, you could just move on. Or on the other hand, yeah. if you really loved it, you could extend your stay and it didn't matter because you had two weeks till you had a flight and that was the only thing on your calendar. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's true. I, I miss that flexibility. I mean, it's a lot harder with kids and depends yeah, on where you travel. Like we've done a lot of U S travel. So it's always busy. Kind yeah. Of and it's always but... chain hotels anyway in the U S. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's not exciting. <laughs> but yeah, I got to admit, I've only done that roll up and find a place once with my family. Um, when we were traveling around Guatemala, we did that. Um, but yeah, with the child, you really got to make sure you got the right bed configuration. If you've got two of them, then it really matters. Okay. So you have a chapter in your book called, are you cut out for this life? And I wanted to uh, talk about that because I think it's really important. I know, uh, people that I've gone, uh, lived abroad on teaching programs with that left like three months later, because they realized they weren't cut out for it. And I know people who've sold their homes all their possessions are bought an RV to travel full time and realize they didn't like it and they weren't cut out for it. So to help people avoid making, you know, it could be a really expensive mistake in that way. How would you know if you're cut out for it and sort of what qualities do you need to just kind of survive and enjoy this experience? Yeah, well, first of all, do you like to travel? Um, <laughs> if you don't, you're probably not going to enjoy this life. I've, I've got a couple of friends that have just come right out and said that, like, I really don't like to travel. I don't like to leave home. To me, that's completely perplexing, you know, and I, I can't imagine yes. feeling like that. I get such itchy feet when I get stuck in one place for a long time. But for some people, that's the ideal life. So first of all, you know, do you like getting out there and experiencing new things? And having adventures or does that fill you with dread? <laughs> because if it if it doesn't get you excited, then you're probably not gonna like living in a different place either. Um, but if you are the kind of person that's um, adventurous and, and likes to uh, try new things, then my best advice is to go do a trial run somewhere, um, mm -hmm. rent an apartment in a regular neighborhood, you know, not where all the tourists are. Um, you could do that easily now through Airbnb or VRBO or whatever. Um, Go rent a place for like two, three, four weeks and just live there like a local would and go shopping and get your clothes washed and, you know, get your shoes repaired, whatever, you know, just kind of go out there and experience it um, like a real person would would and just wander the streets and the neighborhoods and, and get a feel for the place. And then I think probably by the end of that, you'll know if it's a good life for you and if that place is right for you or not. And if it's not, then, you know, find another place and do it again. Mm -hmm. But um you know, I think we've all traveled to places where we've gone, oh, I could live here. This is great. Mm -hmm. And then we've traveled to others where we've been there for three days and gone, okay, I think I've done everything I wanted to do here. Let's go. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. really, uh, this place is not, uh, not exciting me. So, um, and that's not going to be the same for everybody. You know, some people love the mountains, some love the beach, some love cities, some want to be where they can't see their neighbors. You know, it kind of depends on your own personal desires, but the best way is just to get out there and get your feet wet and try it out. And, um, but you know, one of the kind of indicators I've found after talking to a lot of people about this is the ones that do travel a lot internationally and have done that for years are usually very comfortable moving to a new place. Mm. Um, also the ones that are open-minded and, and I want to, I want to use liberal in the, you know, original sense of the world word. I mean, people that are kind of, um, you know, live and let live and, and progressive in their in their views of other cultures and not too bigoted. <laughs> Those kind of people mm -hmm. tend to have an easier time. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're super tied into your local community, you know, if you're if the most important thing in your life is your local church or your local chess club or you know, whatever, you might have a hard time because you're really going to miss those things and those people. And um, if you're used to seeing your grandkids every two or three days, then 
you're, you might have a tough time if you're only going to see them every six months. And so you kind of got to take all of that into account. I mean, you can keep in touch with people so easily these days with yeah. these video calls and everything else. But, you know, it's not the same as seeing them in person. And if you move somewhere like um, Argentina or Thailand, you're going to have a long flight to get home. It's going to take you an entire day crossing a date line, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> so, expensive as well. Not, it's going to be expensive. So you're not going to be able to just bop home anytime you want. Yeah, I think that, like being flexible and adaptable is key and, and um, being okay with things not being the same as what you're used to. I mean, that's the whole point of doing it is to experience something new and there's, you know, nothing worse than even just travelling without living abroad, going to a new destination and expecting it to be like home and then getting upset when it's not and um, right. which I think, you know, some people do and they are the ones that tend to just kind of, fall apart and end up going home because they can't accept or learn to love the differences rather than kind of be afraid by them or stressed out by them, I guess. Yeah. And um, in most of these developing countries, patience is definitely a virtue. You yes. will not get anything as quickly, as easily and as easily as you got it in the United States or Canada. So understand that and, and be ready for some waiting around. <laughs> exactly. And it's such a lovely way that it changes you i think it it forces you to just just don't worry about it you know it'll happen when it happens and slow down right. and i think you just start to change and be just come like a, a more zen person so there's a lot of right. value in that if you just kind of learn to breathe deep and just let the angst over it go yeah and you've met my wife she's kind of a type a personality and she's struggled with this a lot um especially you know we've had hand, a couple handymen over the years and one of them was we just stopped using because he was driving donna crazy because he would never show up within two hours of when he said he was going to but the thing is he got it all done eventually you know yeah like that's you just have to get used to that sort of mindset where it's going to get done just not as fast as you want yeah. yeah, just have another fruit juice and you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what um so if someone is thinking and they're uh, deciding that I really want to look at doing this more, what do you think their first steps should be to get started? Uh, because it's very overwhelming. I know everyone has a list a mile long of places they want to go and see and do. And some people won't start because they just don't know where to start. So where do you recommend? Right. So my book's a good start. I mean, I put it out there mm -hmm. because it sort of fills a hole in the market. There wasn't really any other book out there like this, and there's still not. Um, and I found most of the moving abroad books were very rah-rah and, you know, unrealistic, I think. And, and they sort of gloss over the difficulties and make it just mm. sound like paradise wherever you're going to go. And that's not really the reality that people experience. And mm -hmm. I do think the pros vastly outweigh the cons, but there are cons that you have to be aware of. And yes. So, um, you know, I mean, of course, I'm not saying my book's the be all end all. That's the start. Um, then after that, you know, there's lots of research you can do online. There's lots of publications. Um, I did subscribe to International Living for a lot of years mm -hmm. before I moved, and I do think there's a lot of good, solid advice in there. You just got to put up with a lot of sales pitches, unfortunately, um, but it's uh, still valuable information. Um, and then once you've decided on a place, the best thing to do is join up with any message board or Facebook group that you can find that's about um, expats in that area. And there's going to be one if there's more than a handful of foreigners mm -hmm. there. Um, yep. They're going to find a way to, to get together. And so this city, I mean, I think has four of them. There's two regular ones and then there's one about events and there's one about um, food. <laughs> it's just about yeah. local local places to eat. It's called uh, Consume Local or something like that. Um, so, you know, we only have a few hundred foreigners here. So I think anywhere you go, you're going to find plenty of resources. And you could just search those forums and lurk and, you know, you'll probably get all your questions answered just doing that. But if you have anything specific you want to know that nobody has brought up before, you can ask someone on there and probably within a few hours you'll have an answer. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you can do all that from home. You don't have to go anywhere. But then, of course, eventually you got to get out and travel a bit and really explore. And even within a country, there's going to be more than one place you could possibly live and in a country like Mexico, there's mm. going to be 20 of them. So 
you kind of got to get out there and explore a little bit and see which place speaks to you as they say yeah and what would you think what would you recommend say is three great destinations i know it's all subjective it depends on what everyone wants but what would you think are three really great destinations for living abroad well i kind of want to give a caveat to that because um, now especially you've got a lot more people living abroad who are working still and they're working a remote job that has regular hours and expectations. So I think in that sense, you're kind of better off looking um, in your own sort of vertical. Like if you're coming from the US or Canada and you're still working, you probably want to go to Latin America because you're going to roughly mm -hmm. be on the same time zone, maybe you know two time zones off, three at the most. Whereas if you go to Thailand, um, you're going to be in, on exactly <laughs> the opposite time of everybody mm -hmm. you need to talk to so unless your job is just completely online you never have to call anyone that doesn't work out very well and your relatives might like might, might not be appreciative if you call them at four in the morning you know so yeah that's a consideration if you're european it's a lot easier to uh, go somewhere like portugal or hungary or morocco than it is for you to try to you know again go to the other side of the world um but if you're retired, then it doesn't matter so much if, unless you got to get home to see the grandkids regularly. Um, so then you're, you can kind of open it up more. But to get back to your question, I think in the Americas, the most popular places for expats to move to are probably um, Mexico, uh, Panama and Ecuador. But Colombia mm -hmm. is close. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's very popular, too. The, the last few years, it's, it's really grown a lot and it's fairly easy to get residency there. Um, in Europe, Portugal is definitely the hot spot right now because a lot of Brits have moved there to, you know, when, once this whole Brexit thing started, mm. uh, um, that they were already moving there because it's sunny and warm, but <laughs> they were uh, yeah. also moving there because of trying to get European, uh, you know, residency of some kind to get that sorted. And, um, but, you know, the there's two sort of clusters there for moving abroad, um, the Balkan countries and Eastern Europe are the, you know, former Iron Curtain countries. So, both those areas, there's lots of choices. And um, uh, I would love to go to Bulgaria for like six months. I don't, mm. I don't know if I'd want to be there all winter. Like I'm going to go there on a ski trip next year, I think. But um, I wouldn't want to live there in the winter because they do have a real winter. But uh, there's other places that have milder climates. And then Asia, the easiest places to go set up are, um, are Malaysia if you're retired because they have this thing called the My Second Home program where if you suck a bunch of money in a bank, uh, Malaysian bank, you can stay there um, long term. Yeah. Thail Thailand has a similar thing, but it's a lot more money. Malaysia is more reasonable. Um, and then just if you're younger, I would say Cambodia or Vietnam because they're um, mm. both fairly easy. Vietnam, you can't really get residency, um, but they're real lax about the tourist visa. Whether you, you know, if you just keep leaving and coming back, they're fine with that, whereas Thailand's not. So those are kind of the easiest choices. Um, Philippines is popular with some people. I'm not a big fan, but they do speak English there, so that makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. Well, that's great. That's really great advice. And um, now you've got me excited to look at living abroad, even though I am doing it. But <laughs> you think, oh yeah, yeah I didn't. I'd love to I didn't mention. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't mention Georgia. That's another hot spot right now for digital yeah. nomads because you can stay for a year on a tourist visa, but they also just instituted a, um, a digital nomad residency program as well. Yeah, that's great. And I'm sure the, you know, people keep updated with where they want to go. More of those kind of digital nomad visas at least will, will start coming out because that's sort of where everything is evolving to and more and more people can now, they've now discovered they can work online. So why not go and live abroad if you can earn money and yeah. live in another culture? And I just wanted to get back to a question you asked, asked at the beginning about um, how long you can stay somewhere. Um, just so people know, as a rule of thumb, mm -hmm. you can generally stay for two or three months somewhere before you have to leave on a tourist visa. Yep. But the, the sticky part about that is in Europe, you can only stay three months out of six. So you basically have to get out of that uh, Schengen zone for at least three months. So Europe's a bit more difficult if you just roll up as a tourist to, to stay there long yeah, term. Right. Yeah, that's really important for people to consider because how often do you want to be moving and doing visa runs, as they call them? That can be an absolute pain and expensive as well. So important for people to know. And what if a pandemic hits? 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> we all never would have dreamed. Yeah. <laughs> and yet here we are. <laughs> I actually did an article on my travel blo- travel writing blog about bloggers stuck abroad because there were a lot of them yeah. that got stuck in yeah. some country and then couldn't get out and couldn't go back home and it was uh-huh. a big mess. Yeah, there's I mean there's still a lot of Australians stuck because the borders so strict strictly closed and then they can't get back because of flights they just cancel flights left right and center and the flights are at one stage were like four thousand dollars and so mm-hmm. i know i know many australians who have just been stuck for the past year in other countries and you know very distressed about it um but you know that's we're living in unusual times and generally that's not something people would have to worry about but perhaps now you know people might want to have like a contingency plan in case something like this hopefully it won't but in case something like this happens again <laughs> yeah actually we just got our residency permits we have to finish the process here in mexico but that's the main reason we did it just because if something like this happens again and the borders get locked down um you know i don't want to have to leave mm-hmm. just because my visa is expiring which is what the case was last time um i mean yeah. we left last summer and we were okay because we you know, had the six months start over again, but a lot of people had to go to the consulate and ask for an extension. Yeah, yep. Tough. Well, it's been great chatting with you, Tim. You have so much information and your book is awesome. And I really highly recommend anyone who's thinking of doing this to to read your book because you outline different countries and the costs of living there and uh, working abroad tips, digital nomad tips. There's so much information in that book. So can you just let everyone know where they can find that book and how they can connect with you? Sure. The uh, book site is called cheaplivingabroad.com and that links out to all the various ways you can buy it. It is on Amazon as a paperback and audiobook, so you can get it there. Uh, I sell the ebook directly though, because I throw in a bunch of other goodies and I also cool. just keep in touch with everybody by email yep. that way. If you buy it through Amazon, I, I don't know who you are, but if you buy it from me, I do. So I, I chose to sell the ebook that way. Um, and uh, the audio book is read by a professional voice actor, my, not me with my ums and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, um, if you want to read my regular book, uh, Rants. I'm on the Cheapest Destinations blog. I've been running that since 2003, so I'm one of the pioneers of the blogging mm-hmm. world, I guess. And it's just me on there. I run some other sites where I've got some other writers. And if you could just remember my name, my portfolio site is timleffel.com, and that links out to everything. I'm not a hard guy to find because there's not many people with my name, thankfully, mm-hmm. in this Google yeah. age. Yeah, yeah, it makes a difference. <laughs> Probably not, hey? many, not many Kaz make pieces out there either. <laughs> There isn't, and even less Kalira make piece for our elder. She's, I think, <laughs> one of three people named Kalira in the world. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, and, and for everyone listening or if you're watching on YouTube, I will have uh, links to all of Tim's sites and his um, ebook there too. So you can easily just click on that if, if, if you're listening and on our site in the show notes. So thanks, Tim. It's been great chatting with you from Mexico, and I hope that we can catch up again soon when this pandemic is over and we can finally go to conferences and hang out again. It would be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing old friends face-to-face again. It's been a while. Yeah, same here. Mexico's on our list, so we'll be there to catch up with you and Donna when we're, we're down there, and you can take us for these cheap breakfasts. Well, we're saying as soon as I get vaccinated and everyone that comes to visit is, is vaccinated, come one, come all. We've got a guest. Yep. Here. I love it. <laughs> saying that's what we're saying the same thing. Party town. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Tim, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode, guys. All right. Thanks for having me on.